Hello. We're going to read. From this book, Symbols, page 844. The symbolism of the serpent. Serpent. Serpent are as different from all animal species as the human race, but at the opposite end on the scale. If mankind may be regarded as standing at the end of a long revolutionary struggle, we must set this cold-blooded, armless, hairless, featherless creature as its very beginning. In this sense, mankind and serpents are opposites, complementary and rivals, the one to the other. In this sense, too, there is something of the serpent in all human beings, and strangely enough, in that portion of them over which they have the least control, an analyst has remarked that the serpent is a vertebrate creature embodying the lower psyche, hidden psychosis, and what is unusual, incomprehensible, and mysterious. There is nothing so simple or so commonplace as a serpent, and yet, by virtue of this very simplicity, nothing which shocks the spirits more. At the wellsprings of life, the serpent a soul and libido. Travelers in the south and Cameroons have observed that in their hunting language, the pygmies depict serpents as a line on the ground, and doubtless similar cave drones have exactly the same meaning. They may be said to take the serpent back to its original manifestation. It may only be a line, but it is a living line, what André Virel calls an abstraction in flesh and blood. Lines have neither beginning nor end, and once they come alive, they become capable of depicting whatever you like or of changing into any shape. All that can be seen of the line is what is immediately made manifest in space and time, and yet one is aware at either end it is produced into invisible infinity. The same is true of the serpent. When made visible on earth, the serpent in the instant of its manifestation is the sacred maiden manifest. Above and beyond this, there is a feeling that it is a continuation of the infinite materialization which is none other than a primordial formlessness, the storehouse of latency which underlies the manifest world. The serpent which we see is the manifestation of the holiness of nature, a holiness which is material and in no sense spiritual. It makes its appearance in the sunlit world like a ghost which one can touch but which slips through one's fingers. So the serpent evades time which can be clocked, space which can be measured, and logic which can be rationalized to escape to the lower reaches from which it came and in which it can be imagined timeless, changeless, and motionless in the fullness of its life. Swift as lightning, the serpent streaks from the dark mouth of some crevice of cranny to vomit life or death, before returning again to invisibility. Or else the serpent discards its male appearance to become female, coiling up, entwining around, squeezing, throttling, swallowing, digesting, and sleeping. The sea serpent is the invisible serpent principle which dwells in the lower levels of consciousness and the deeper strata of the earth. It is secret and equivocal. Its decisions are unpredictable and as swift as its transformations. Ever ambivalent, it toys with its own sexuality. It is both male and female, twins within the same body, like so many of the culture heroes who are always depicted initially as cosmic serpents. The serpent does not therefore depict an archetype but an archetypal complex linked to the freezing, clammy subterranean darkness of the beginning of things. All possible snakes together for one single primordial manifoldedness. As inseparable primordial, something which yet is ever coiling and uncoiling, which ever melting away and re emerging. 
Yet, what is this primordial something if it is not latent life, or as Key Serling puts it, the lowest layer of life? It is the wellspring potentiality from which all manifestation derives. Never most life, he continues, must needs be reflected in daylight consciousness in the form of a snake, as indeed the Chaldeans had but one word for serpent and life, came. René Guénon makes the same observation. Serpent symbolism is in fact linked to the notion of life itself. In Arabic, the word for serpent is El Hayah, and that for life El Hayat, adding, and this is of prime importance that El Hay, one of the principal names of God, should not be translated as the living, but as the life giving, the one who bestows life or who is principle of life itself. The serpent which we should therefore be regarded simply as a fleeting incarnation of a great invisible serpent, casual and atemporal, lord of the life principle and of the powers of nature. The serpent is an old god, the first god to be found at the start of all cosmogenesis before religions of the spirit dethroned him. He created life and sustained it. On a human level, he is the dual symbol of soul and libido. The serpent is one of the most important archetypes of the human soul. Wrote Bachelard, in Tantris, the serpent is the Kudalini coiled round the base of the spinal column on the sleep state chakra, its mouth closes, the urethral mitus. When the serpent awakes, kisses and stiffens, ascent through the successive chakra takes place. This is the rising tide of the libido, the fresh manifestation of life. The Cosmic Serpent From the macrocosmic viewpoint, the Kundalini's equivalent is the serpent Ananta, which wraps its coils around the base of the world axis. Ananta is associated with Vishnu and Shiva and symbolizes cyclical expansion and contraction, but as guardian of the Nadir, Rajneeth, he carries the world upon himself and ensures its stability. When building a house in India, as with all houses, we should send at the center of the world, the pile is sunk into the head of the subterranean Naga. Once Yomati has established where it lies, those who carry the world are sometimes elephants, bull tortoises, crocodiles, and so on, where there are only sourdates of different animal shapes of the serpent in its original world. <coughs> Thus the Sanskrit word Nanga means both serpent and elephant, and this may be compared with the equivalence of serpent and tapir in the Maya Quiche world picture. These animals of power are very often depicted by their heads at the end of a serpent's body, or they may themselves be supported by a serpent. In every instance, they stand for the terrestrial aspect, that is the strength and aggression of the manifestation of the great god of darkness who, throughout the world, is a serpent. There are two ways of sustaining something. It may either be carried or enfolded by creating an unbroken circle round it to prevent its falling apart. This second role is filled once again by the serpent python, its tail, the Uroboros. In this context, the circumference complements the center so as to suggest Nicholas of Cusa's notion of God himself. The Uroboros is also the symbol of cyclical manifestation and return, sexual auto intercourse, perpetual self-fertilization, as the tail penetrating the mouth would indicate continuous transformation of death into life, since in fact inject the poison in its own body, or in Bachelard's word, it is the material dialectic of life and death, death springing from life and life from death. While it conjures up the image of a circle, it is predominantly the circus dynamism that is the first wheel, apparently motionless because it revolves on its own axis but with perpetual motion since it is continuously self-renewed. Universal life-giver 
Bobos provides the motive power not only of life but of time, creating both within itself. It is often depicted in the shape of a twisted chain which links the hours, setting the stars in motion. It is also the first representation and mother of the zodiac, an old symbol of an old god of nature dethroned by the spirit, though the Bobos remain a powerful cosmographic and geographic deity, and as such was carved around the edges of the earliest representations of the world, like what is undoubtedly the earliest black African in Mago Mundi, the Benin disc. Its sinuosities frame all things, bringing together opposites, the primeval oceans on which flows the square shape of the earth. Terrifying in its hunger, it becomes the Jewish Leviathan, or the Norse Migdaldoan which is the head that tells us, was older than the gods themselves, causing the tides when the dragon storms were he belched. Returning to the cosmogenetic level, the serpent is ocean itself, its nine holes encircling the earth and its tent. So he states in his theogony, running beneath it to form the sticks. In the final analysis, this emanation of formless primeval matter, from which all things spring, to which all things return to be renewed, may be likened to an object thrown from one hand and caught by the other. Underworld and ocean, primordial waters and depths of the earth simply compose the materia prima, primeval matter, from which the serpent is made. The serpent was the first water spirit and is the spirit of the waters below and above the earth's surface. Crapper stresses the fact that countless rivers and glyphs, Greece and Asian mania bore the name of office snake or dragon, and then there were Father Rhine and Mother Volga, the river god Deus Sekena, the sign. Very often the attributes of the animal shape adopted explain the heavenly or earthly functions of the river died. The Belgian corn timber may be explained as a depiction of the serpent which has taken to itself the strength of the bull, typified by its horns. Similarly, the Achelos, the greatest river of ancient Greece, successively took the shapes of serpent and bull to combat Heracles, Hercules. As the deity of clouds, as the dating rain, serpents sometimes take to themselves the powers of the realm, hence the hardened serpent so common in Celtic, and particularly in Gaulish iconography or of birds, these are the far eastern winged dragons, and their Central American counterparts, the plumped serpents. We are familiar with the basic importance attaching to symbolic images in these two great agrarian civilizations and the particular attention which they paid to meteorological phenomena. In the Far East, celestial dragons were the founding fathers of many dynasties and the Chinese emperors carried one embroider on their banners to denote the divine origins of their empire. In American Indian mythologies from Mexico to Peru, Alexander stresses the myth of the serpent bird coincides with the oldest religious rituals connected with the civilization of maize. The myth being associated with moisture and with the waters of the world regions, yet always in these greater forms with the sky. He is not only the green father snake and the cloud snake bearded with rain, but he is also the son of a serpent, and again the house of Zeus, and lord of the dawn. The plumed serpent is first of all the rain cloud, and in a special right the high terrace, silver shining cumulus cloud of midsummer whence he is called the white god, from whose black belly falls the reek of rain. In New Mexico he is represented a serpent body, whose dorsal burden is the cumulus cloud and whose tongue is the jack levin, the Chinese dragon it will be called swims in just such belowing cumulus, the old gold and mythic ancestor. When the serpent became the mythic ancestor and culture hero most familiar in the shape of the Toltecs, what get coat, 
which the Aztecs also adopted, the serpent became flesh and sacrificed itself for the human race. Indian iconography explains the meaning of this sacrifice, thus the Dresden Codex depict. A bird of prey striking its talons into the serpent's body so that the blood from which civilized mankind is to be created will flow. The god, the serpent, in this context turns the celestial powers of his own attribute, the sound bird against himself to make fertile mankind slant. For this god is the cloud, and this blood is the rain which will enable the maize to grow and mankind to live from the maize. One could elaborate upon this sacrifice, which is not only that of the cloud, but the death of desire's wealth, in the fulfillment of its loving mission on a more clear cosmogonic level, and one which is in Sufi become the foundation of a mysticism, it is the splitting of primordial oneness, the two in one, into its two components to create the human order. Jacques Sustel regarded with that Sacrifice as a variation upon the classic theme of initiation, death followed by birth, when Chalcoat became the sun and died in the west to be reborn in the east. Within himself he was two in one, and dialectic and became the guardian of twins. The same symbolic complex recurs in Black Africa, the mythic ancestor and cultured hero of the Dogon, is the warrior god Nomo. He is depicted with a snake's body instead of a human lower limbs. He brought mankind the most valuable culture gifts, metal working and corn, and is also called two and one. He too sacrificed himself for the good of the new human race. Many other examples might be quoted from African tradition, and especially that of Dan or Da, the great god from Benin, and the slave coast, who is the serpent, and the fetish rainbow maul. In Haitian voodoo, he became Dambalavedo and is the lord of springs and rivers, for both movement and water are in his nature. The thunderstorm is sacred to him, and he forbids his servants, that is, those who become possessed by him to invoke any deity who works both good and evil, except Tinwin Squad, his neighbors. He is also lightning, and above all, god of strength and fertility. Now Dan is still the old god of nature. In present day, Benin, the Uroboros of the Benin Dis, described above the Maphrodite and himself twin. This would explain the worship of the sacred pythons kept in the temples of Abome, and girls are dedicated to them, being ritually betrothed to those gods at this time of crop sowing. The Yoruba regard Dan, whom they call Osumare, as the rainbow licking the upper and lower levels of the world and only to be seen after rain. Fraser cites Bosman for evidence that the Guinea coastal tribes invoke the snake in excessively wet, dry or barren seasons. All these examples, taken from cultures which have developed independently of our own, explain how the serpent's connections with the weather of which there are survivals in European folklore have originated. There is a widely held belief, proper rights, what rainbows are a serpent drinking from the sea. This notion occurs not only in France but among the Nevada Indians in North America and the Boer in South America and South Africa and in India. All these attestations are no more than so many applications in the specific areas of the myth of the great primeval serpent, an expression of formless primal matter. It is the beginning and the end of every manifestation, and this explains its prime eschatological significance to which we return to the highly complex development of the serpent symbol in European civilization. But first we should remember but the Batak in Malaysia believe that the cosmic serpent lives in the underworld and that it will destroy the world. The Huichol cosmic serpent has two heads which comprise two pairs of monstrous jaws gaping at east and west. From the one he vomits the rising sun and with the other he swallows the setting sun. And now we come to the oldest created god in the Mithraian world, 
the serpent Atum, father of the nine deities of Heliopolis. He was the one who spat out the whole of creation. At the beginning of time, after he had emerged by his own efforts from the primeval waters, as he was alone, written sources are divided as to the origin of his people, and some state that, that it came not from his mouth, but from his penis, and him, in fact, masturbating rather than spitting. Thus, the first pair of gods sprang into existence, Chu and Phoenix, who brought into the world Geb and Nut, respectively air and moisture, earth and heaven. Then Atum rose up before his creation, and according to the Book of the Dead, addressed in these words, I am he who remains. The earth shall return to formless chaos, and then I shall transform myself into a serpent which no man knows and no god sees. No mythology has depicted the great primeval serpent so baldly. Atum has no need to swallow the sun. He has nothing to do with the underworld, the Chthonian realm in which our life dies and is reborn every day. He is serpent only before and after the totality of the space-time continuum, in a region to which neither gods nor mortals have access, and is truly the first of the old gods, the Deus Otiosus of nature in his pitiless transcendence. Nevertheless, the realm below the earth, which the sun must traverse every night to ensure his own rebirth, were set wholly under the side of the serpent in ancient Egypt as elsewhere. Although Atum may have had no part to play within the drama, it is nevertheless he who illuminated it exactly. Stripped of his serpent's shape, each evening he became god of the setting sun, pointing in the west the way to the depths below. He then planked underground on a boat on which he took his place surrounded by all his heavenly retainers. The notion of the belly of the earth in which this alchemical regeneration occurs, being under the predominant influence of the serpent, is described in minutest details in the Book of the Dead. The route taken by the sun is divided into twelve four calls, corresponding to the twelve hours of darkness. The sun both first crosses sandy shoals, inhabited by serpents, and soon changes into a serpent itself. At the seventh hour, a fresh snake form appears. Apophis, the monstrous embodiment of the lord of the underworld, and a prefiguration of the Old Testament, Satan. His calls entwine a mound 450 cubits long. His voice attracts the gods who will win him. This incident marks the climax of the drama. At the eleventh hour, the sun bow tow rope becomes a serpent. Lastly, during the twelfth, in the cat chamber of the dome, the sun bow is dragged through a serpent 1,300 cubits long, and when it comes of the mouth, the rising sun is to be seen in the shape of a scarab of the bosom of Mother Earth. The sun is reborn to begin afresh its ascent of the heavens. To sum up, the sun has to change into serpent in order to do battle with other serpents, one in particular, before being swallowed and expelled through the earth's serpent-like gut. One might elaborate at great length on this evolution of a swallower-swallowed complex, beside which Jonah's fate seems quite straightforward. The serpent may be regarded worldwide as the great regenerator and initiator lord of the earth's realm, like that womb simultaneously the enemy in the dialectic sense of the word of the sun, hence of light, and therefore of mark kind spiritual sight. It has a lot more, a lot more, a lot more. Maybe next time we stop page 150. This is part one. Thank you.